So hello everyone and uh, welcome to this seminar today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you today Luis, who is coming from Stuttgart uh, to visit the PFM. Uh, he's an independent group leader now uh, there joined last uh, autumn. Uh, he did his uh, undergrad studies in Brazil in the University of Sao Paulo. Then he moved to UPenn, Pennsylvania for his PhD and then to Berkeley for, uh, for his postdoc. So your general interests are in the domain of machine learning, uh, statistics, optimization. Uh, he has got many different awards for his, for his research. I will not mention that. I'm sure that these things, you can find them in his website. But what I wanted to mention is that he's a very talented person. I realize that he can speak more than four or five languages among <laughs> those. <laughs> Even Greek, so. <laughs> uh, so thanks for coming and the floor is yours. Aristotle, Rina. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for the introduction. What uh, I wanted to talk about is today, as the title of my talk suggests, is learning under requirements. I prepared this talk so that you don't need to know either learning or requirements. So I will go over, you know, the details of things, but if you want to get into the nitty gritty, you know, technical details, we can do that over the Q&A or, or afterwards. I'm happy to, I'm still going to be around for a little while. Now to understand why I got interested into learning under requirements, I think it's interesting to look a little bit at like how the current state of learning is, you know, especially in engineering, right? So a lot of the use of learning in engineering is to uh, design complex systems, right? So the traditional cycle for designing systems in engineering would be to, you know, they have an engineer set requirements, acquire data, build models, and from that, optimize you know, operational set. Now, a lot of the work that I've done over the years, uh, you know, the past few years, is a, is a nice name, but um, is about adding requirements to each of the stacks of, this, of these different things from, you know, uh, discrete uh, constraints on the number of experiments that you can run to resilience in control. But the issue with this cycle is that as systems become larger and more complex, it becomes even more, more costly, costly and intricate to iterate over this cycle. And you know, the promise of learning, at least in this context, is to take us from data to uh, optimization to operation with little to no human intervention. And in many senses, that uh, promise has become an emerging reality as learning becomes a core technology that underlines a lot of applications from you know, healthcare all the way to photonics research. Now behind a lot of these successes is the idea of empirical risk minimization or ERM, right? So ERM is simply an optimization problem that fits models by minimizing their average uh, loss over samples. That's not a new idea. This has been used in statistical inference for 200 years. It's the basis of what Gauss was using to fit planetary orbits, right? But we know that linear regression doesn't really drive cars, so what, what, there has to be something else going on here. And it turns out that the thing that made, let's say, ERM the transformative engine that it is today are essentially three breakthroughs over the past 50 years. I will summarize that to three breakthroughs. Obviously, it's more than that. The first one is the thing that motivates a lot of my work nowadays, which is the development of classical learning theory. Right? So back in the 70s, 80s, there were a series of papers that showed that the ERM is actually the solution of a statistical problem. That's something similar to the law of large numbers happens here. And it turns out that the models that you get for cert certain parameterizations out of optimizing this average loss actually fits not only the samples that you have, but also the whole distribution. Right? That combined with the advent of the internet and deep learning, which gave us a lot of data to learn from and you know, tractable, flexible uh, parameterizations to learn with made you know, this sort of emerging reality appear, let's say, in, in what we have today. Now, obviously, behind these successes, there are a lot of biased and um, prejudiced models that are prone to tempering and, um, and you know, uh, unsafe behavior that still show how far away we are from building trustworthy systems built on this, let's say, learning paradigm. Now, over the past 10 years or so, every piece of the ERM has essentially been investigated and improved in order to mitigate some of these issues from the generalization properties of the parameterization to limitations of the data to characteristics of the loss of landscape of the optimization loss all the way to you know um, implicit biases of the training algorithms now what 
the idea that I want to, 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 or the alternative, let's say, narrative that I want to bring here today is to argue that actually what's happening is that there's nothing wrong and we're just being victims of our own success. In a sense, you know, learning is doing exactly what we asked for, even though it's not what we want, right? We're essentially in the German tale of Goethe that, you know, sold his soul to the devil in order to get his powers just to end up ruining his own life. Not that learning is ruining our lives, just a different point. But what happens here in, under this idea, it's not the point about trying to learn better, but it's about to a uh, point of trying to find a different way to learn. And if we go back to this engineering cycle, right, which is where I grew up with, what we are missing becomes clear, which are the requirements, I would argue. And, you know, so the proposal that I want to put forward this in, in this talk, or let's say base this talk on, is the assumption or the, 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 the idea that we need to somehow move forward from this idea of minimizing risks as a way to learn and start learning and the report. Okay, so if you fall asleep now and forget everything else that I say, just this, this is a good slide to remember. And it's not because it makes it look like I read Goethe, it's because, you know, it's the point that I want to spend the next, I don't know, 50 minutes or 45 minutes developing to try to convince you that that's actually the case. So there are actually three things that I would like to um, convince you of today. So my goal is to convince you of three things. The first one is that constraint learning is the right tool to learn on the requirements. That constraint learning as a problem is, is, is hard, it looks hard, but that it is possible to do, okay? So, okay. So let me start by developing the first point by essentially showcasing two examples of cost rate learning problems that we could tackle using this framework, right? Starting with a problem that is a classical problem in telecommunication, which is wireless resource allocation. Okay. So the problem of wireless resource allocation is the problem of allocating transmit powers to a series of devices in order to achieve a certain communication rate. In other words, in order to you know, achieve a certain rate of information transmitted between those devices. Now here, the communication rate is the requirement that we want to meet, right? Now, the determining parameter in a lot of uh, telecommunication uh, devices or in a telecommunication system is the receive power. And among other things, what it determines is the rate of information that we can actually transmit. Now, the difficulty in these wireless systems is that this channel actually varies somewhat randomly with time, right? which poses a challenge because it might fade which means that it becomes essentially unusable at some times, but also poses an opportunity because sometimes that channel becomes you know, much better than average. So the idea here is to leverage this variability by you know, allocating power according to the channel in order to maximize the you know, long-term average of our, um, to achieve a certain long-term average uh, communication rate. Right? For one pair of devices, for a single device, over a channel like an AWGN channel, like an additive white noise, Gaussian noise channel with a well-known distribution, everything, this problem is easy to solve and there are many solutions. When you get interference in the game, things become a little bit more complicated, right? And there are many ways. On top of that, it's not only that we have a complicated optimization problem from the point of view of being non-linear, non-convex, we also typically don't have information about the distributions of the channel. There are a lot of very good models, but it's not really something that we know very well. So what we want to do is not really rely on models here, but actually we want to use samples in order to learn that, um, that distribution, that, that, that problem, to solve this problem. If we parameterize the, 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 the policy, right, we can see that directly this looks, this is starting very much to look like an ERM problem that you have been looking around, right? So in a sense, wireless communication Wireless resource allocation, not really an application of, of, of constraint learning. It is a constraint learning problem that we can solve. And using a lot of the techniques that I will discuss today and later on, we can actually achieve in a model free way, a rate, a sum capacity, which is the rate of, inf of information uh, that, that gets received by the devices that is very close to classical methods that are based on models of the channel on knowing the models of the channel. Or in certain cases, when you have very large networks, if we use proper you know, parameterizations like graph neural networks, we can actually exceed the rates of uh, transmission that we can achieve, again, in a model-free way from the point of view of the channel, right? Okay. Now, 
this is not the only thing we can use constraint optimization with, uh, constraint learning with. Obviously, this is a, quite an engineering problem. There is also something that is perhaps a little bit more familiar in the context of, um, of machine learning, which is robust image recognition, right? So this is somewhat a more, let's say, well-known problem in, in the context of machine learning, which is the problem of showing a picture of a cello to a computer, have it recognize that it's actually a cello. And that's not a particularly hard in quotes problem because that's something that really nowadays we can achieve very high accuracy with off the shelf models using off the shelf training models. It's, it's quite like in a sense for specific benchmarks, it's not very hard to get good results out of it. The issue is that these type of models that we obtain are typically very brittle, right? So very small perturbations of this image can make bring the accuracy of the model from above 80%, 90% to below 1%. Okay? This is a well-known problem that is known as, you know, adversarial examples in, uh, in learning. So what's the typical way to deal with this is to use adversarial training to deal with this requirement, which is the robustness of to input perturbations, right? So adversarial trainings, adversarial training is the idea that instead of measuring our loss or training our parameterization with respect to clean data, we will use, uh, you know, worst case perturbations of the data in order to train. So instead of measuring our performance in terms of the clean samples, we'll use an adversarial measure of performance, which includes worst case perturbations of the image. Now, many of the issues with adversarial training have to do with how do we compute this worst case perturbation in order for us to do optimization, right? The typical way to do that is to use some sort of gradient ascent method, which you know has leads to very good solutions in practice. However, it has the issue that you know we have to solve here what is a maximization, which is a non-convex and a severely underparameterized problem, right? Typically, when we are solving, when we are optimizing, this minimization is over a very high number of parameters, and you know we can leverage some uh, beneficial, let's say, optimization landscape in order to do that. But now we are talking about a problem that is much harder to solve in general. Now, still, if we do that in practice, we can obtain, you know, um, we can obtain solutions that have much better robustness than we typically would have at the cost, obviously, of, you know, undermining slightly, let's say, our accuracy on, on the nominal case, which is, you know, properties that robust systems often have. The typical way to deal with this trade-off would be to use some sort of penalty method, right? So in a penalty method, what we'll do is simply combine the two losses that we actually want, the two objectives that we want to achieve, right? As in multi-objective optimization, we will combine the clean loss with the uh, adversarial loss into a single optim uh, optimization, uh, single objective that we can optimize against and tune essentially the weight between those two, depending on how, we, uh, how much we want to give, um, uh, how much we want to weigh the different combinations. And again, this is an extremely effective technique that gets us to essentially for the same loss in nominal accuracy, we can get like actually a much better adversarial accuracy. So we're in a better compromise situation than we did before. The issue with this technique is exactly with the choice of this lambda, right? How do we choose that is the big question that we need to answer here. For starters, there is no straightforward relation between lambda and the, and the value of the adversarial loss. So this has to be picked essentially by trial and error over the, you know, as you said. So if you change anything about the problem, be it the loss or the model or the performance measure, you will need to retune that lambda again because the value, the relative value of those losses will have changed, right? That means that in a sense that lambda depends on the data set. And this dependence of lambda on the data leads to certain questions about generalization, right? Classical learning theory that I mentioned in the beginning tells us about generalization of the combined loss, not about each of the individual terms which is actually what we care about doing. And that's exactly where, you know, con the constrained learning part of the problem comes in, which is to overcome this idea. And how do we do that? It's just by using constrained optimization to literally write the problem that we had written in the top of the slide, right? So we will find the most robust among all of the, um, of the classifier, but only among those classifiers that have a good nominal loss. So this is the, uh, the problem that we're interested in. The advantage of this is this is a more, more arguably a more natural way to write the problem because you know, we have this decoupling between what is an objective and what is a requirement that we're trying to meet between these two, let's say, multi-objective problems. Um, and additionally, we have the advantage that, you know, in a sense, C is a problem, is a instance independent value. It is dependent on the problem that we want, obviously the level of accuracy that we want is a problem dependent, but it's not depending on the in specific instance of the problem. 
Now we can take this idea one step further and actually leverage constraint learning to rewrite this whole problem once more to get rid of this maximum as well. By writing this maximum using an, you know, an epigraph form, essentially by completing this problem with an infinite number of constraints, one for each possible perturbation that you could have of the input. Okay? Now, obviously, this is <laughs> not a trivial problem to solve, given the semi-infinite nature of the problem. It's not a new uh, type of optimization. And we can actually leverage you know, sampling techniques in order to have a sort of hybrid sampling optimization method that can give us, actually, slightly better results in terms of um, in terms of the compromises that we can achieve with respect between nominal accuracy and adversarial accuracy. Ultimately, this is what we care about here because this is not a problem and there is a lot of now theoretical and empirical evidence that show that this problem actually has this trade-off necessarily in many cases. So we need to lose a little bit of nominal accuracy to get adversarial accuracy, which is something that, you know, if you're familiar with H infinity controllers, for example, is something that is uh, common in that case. So what we care about is actually navigating this trade-off curve in a slightly better way, right? And that's exactly what allows you, what this method using sampling and, op and constrained optimization allows you to do compared to what this penalty method, which is trades, allows you to do, achieve very good results, but slightly uh, worse in, in case of using a fixed penalty rather than one that we're going to adapt. One of the reasons is because of the choice of lambda, but the other reason why this is better is because, you know, uh, in terms of I'm going the wrong way, in terms of sampling, we are able to better exploit the um, different, let's say, um, directions of the data for the disturbances. Using gradient ascent, for example, here we are looking at the PCA, so the first two principal components from MNIST, right? These are the, per the disturbances uh, projected on the two components. So the first component is obviously the highest variability along the data. Obviously, that's a good component for you to be disturbing against in, the, in that direction, right? And in a sense, sampling is able to better exploit this for a fixed energy uh, budget than, let's say, gradient, a gradient ascent methods. Okay, so enough talking about applications. So as we can see, this seems to be an interesting way to solve some problems and sometimes even quite um, successfully. So what is this thing in the end? So let me define what I mean by constrained learning here. So what I mean by constrained learning is a learning problem, just like unconstrained learning problem, except with constraints. Now, the constraints that we're talking about are not constraints on you know, the L2 norm of the parameters or on some sort of uh, subspace in which the parameters need to lie, but they are statistical constraints. So they are constraints that depend on specific distributions of the data, distributions that, since we are in a learning setting, we do not have access to. Right? So the way we deal with that is for example, we could suggest, as in classical learning, would be to use an empirical approximation of those, of those constraints, right? Of those constraints and objective. The question we need to ask in this case is, is it true that the solution of this problem generalizes to the, to the solution that we actually care about? So this is the first question that we need to deal with, is a statistical question, right? Is it true that this generalizes? We know that in the unconstrained case, that is true from classical learning theory. The question is whether this is also true or how harder it is to do in the case where we are trying to simultaneously solve a, a lot of different optimization problems, essentially. Now, the second issue challenge that we need to overcome is the fact that this problem is a non, often a non-convex problem because the, um, either because the losses are non-convex or because the parameterization is non-linear, in which case we have to solve this non-convex optimization problem. So it is not trivial that you know, we can actually obtain or hope to obtain something that is even close to something somewhat of a solution of this. This is a much more complicated problem than the first one. We'll give a you know, partial answer to this, but this is quite ongoing work still. Right? The issue is, ultimately, in unconstrained optimization problems, you can use some sort of local search like gradient descent to hope to find a good enough you know, local minimum. In this case, even finding a feasible solution could be hard. So how do we, we added complexity to a problem that was already somewhat hard. So let me convince you that it is possible to overcome at least partially uh, these two challenges or in, under certain conditions, these two challenges, starting with the statistical challenge. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to forget about pointwise constraints because the whole theory that I'm going to talk about also applies there. When I get to the theorem at the end, there is a little difference and I will, um, I will point that out. So we can just think about simply 
um, you know, average constraints in that. So let's think of the statistical problem. So as I mentioned in the beginning, classical learning theory has this idea of that there is a sort of sort of law of large numbers that have uniform law of large numbers that happen in this case for a series of parameterization, not for all of them. Those parameterizations are often known as probably approximately correct learnable or pack learnable, right? The idea here, let me break that down for you, is to think in terms of a one-dimensional target. So probably approximately correct means that we're not going to hit the bullseye. We're going to be close to it. And Sometimes we won't even be close to it, but most of the time we will, right? So this is somewhat, somehow, if you think about it, the best that we can expect to do here is to be mostly right most of the time. Because first, we're going to approximate a, you know, expectation using a finite number of samples. So we can only really approximate that up to a certain approximately. But also because the samples are random, obviously, with high probability this will happen, but we might get a bad bunch and just not be able to solve. This is the image to think about. Now, there's a lot of tools that have been used in order to show certain types of uh, whether a specific uh, parameterization is pack learnable, rather much complex, DVC dimension, shattering number, uh, shattering numbers, and V, uh, fat shattering numbers and things of that sort, stability is another one. The question is that this doesn't really talk about the requirements, which is the thing that we are also interested about meeting. It's not only the, optimize, the, the objective, right? So the idea is how what do we define as constraint learning? So it's a direct extension of PAC, which we call you know, probably approximately correct constraint learning or PAC C learning. And the idea is the we are going to use the exact same um, definition of PAC, but we will require two things. First is that with high probability, we need to be close to the solution of the true problem, of the statistical problem. So we need to approximate it well. In the case of PAC, because it has no constraints is like removing just this absolute value. Here we want to approximate it both because we have the constraint set that we'll have to meet, both upper and lower, that's important. And simultaneously, as we approximate the objective, we also want to satisfy the constraints. So we want to be near optimal and approximately feasible with high probability. So these two things need to happen simultaneously now. So we can think of this as a two-dimensional now uh, target, right? We want to be close both in terms of the near optimality, but also in terms of the approximate feasibility. Now, obviously, this is a nice, this is almost um, tautological that is a, if a function is of this sort, then it can be learned using, uh, for example, ERM, right? So if we had to rederive all of the tools that have been derived so far in order to find out whether a, a you know, a parameterization that is PAC learnable is also PAC C learnable, that would not be very useful. Turns out that that's not necessary because those two problems are essentially as hard as each other, which means that if you have a PAC learnable um, parameterization, it is essentially also PAC C learnable. I say essentially because actually these two things are not equivalent. They are implied by the same underlying condition, which is uniform convergence. This is for the learning theoretic crew in the, in the, in the crowd. Under certain conditions, PAC and uniform convergence are equivalent, but this is not always true. So, you know, that, 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 that double arrow did require a little bit of a disclaimer. That's very good news for us because essentially what this means is that any time that we could learn, we could also have learned under constraint. So there's nothing really that makes the problem much harder in this case than it used to be in the original case, okay? Now, what this doesn't tell us is how we are supposed to be learning. Right? How we're supposed to be solving uh, this, con this um, constrained optimization problem, which is the computational question that we need to deal with. So having dealt with the statistical question, which turns out is not, is not as much as a challenge as anticipated, the question now is one of computation. So can we get a learning rule that is practical and that we can use in practice in order to solve this, the, to actually get a solution that approximates this original problem? And the way we're going to do that is by using the idea of duality. Okay. So I promised I was not going to require anything. So let me spend 30 seconds telling you what duality is, what I mean by duality, right? So to, in duality in optimization theory assigns or associates to every constrained optimization problem and unconstrained optimization problem, which is a relaxation of the original one. The big advantage of unconstrained of, of this dual problem is that it's unconstrained. An unconstrained optimization is in many senses easier to solve than constrained optimization. 
Now, obviously, as I said, this is a relaxation of the original problem because a constraint that appeared as a hard constraint now appears as a um, as a cost, as a penalty, let's say, right? Since, so in a sense, the dual problem is only a lower bound on the value of the original primal problem. Now, since this is the best possible linear relaxation since we maximize over lambda, it turns out that in certain cases, we can even hope to get the exact same value. So that lower bound actually matches the upper bound. And in that case, we have what we call strong duality. Now, strong duality is a very interesting property that happens, for example, in convex optimization under very mild conditions, because it essentially tells us that we can find out the value of an optimization problem, constrained optimization problem, only by solving an unconstrained optimization problem. So when that happens, that's very good for us, especially because unconstrained optimization problems are easier to solve. The problem with the specific uh, optimization problem we're interested in is that, you know, it's not convex, so we don't have that strong duality, and we don't even know how bad this approximation is, which is known as the duality gap. That's the challenge that we need to overcome here, which is to essentially characterize this difference between those two. If those two problems are close, then it's good. If they're far away, then we have a, a huge problem. The way we go over overcoming this specific challenge is by using um, a result in duality related to uh, variational problems. So here's what I mean. Even though non-convex finite dimensional optimization problems do not have strong duality, just as convex optimization problems do, it turns out that infinite dimensional problems do. Even though they are non-convex, they manifest very similar pro duality properties as optimization problems that are convex. So let me give you a specific concrete example just to showcase what I mean by infinite and convex here in the context of you know, sparse logistic regression, which is a problem that should be very easy and familiar to everybody, right? So we're trying to find essentially a logistic regression, a classifier, be, uh, bounded by, uh, under the constraint, you know, of uh, some sort of sparsity of that classifier. Now, this is a NP-hard problem. So the typical way to solve this is by relaxing it to a convex problem. So here, we, the barrier of complexity is between non-convex and convex. We're going to exchange the sparsity constraint by an L1 constraint, which is convex. And often there is a literature on you know, compressive sensing that tells us that under certain conditions, the solution of this problem actually recovers the solution of the, of the sparse problem. So the way we want to go about this, the result that I'm mentioning actually takes a different approach. Right? The barrier of complexity is no longer between non-convex and convex, but between discrete and continuous problems. And by what I mean by discrete and continuous is essentially that now, Instead of a finite vector, we have a function that we're trying to identify, right? So it's a variational problem. Turns out that even though the original problem is non-convex, is, is NP-hard that we know, this one is actually one that you can solve in, you know, I mean, polynomial time is not really something that makes sense for optimization problem, but you can approximate it, let's say, in, in polynomial time. Now, obviously, this has a lot of applications in, you know, logistic regression, EEG classification, you can do use that to do multi-resolution kernels or learn by Bayesian posteriors. But what matters to us about this specific result is the fact that even though is the fact that it allows us to say that even though this dual problem, right, the dual empirical problem is not related to the original constrained empirical problem, it is related to the statistical problem we care about directly. So even though these two problems are not related to each other, it turns out that the dual actually solved the original constraint problem we care about, which is the statistical problem. In other words, the solution of this dual problem actually generalizes to the whole population, even though we can't really relate it to the original problem. Now, the reason why this happens is the result that I showed you before has to do with you know, some results in, um, in vector measure theory. That essentially are, if somebody is familiar with game theory, it's very similar to shapley folkman lemma, for example. And the idea is that, you know, things that appear, if the non-convexity appears inside the integral, it gets smoothed out. That's a caricature of the result, obviously. But the idea is one that actually works quite well. So the idea is to leverage the fact that these expectations in this problem are actually integrations to, so, to show strong duality for a variational problem that we can then relate to this dual empirical problem. Right? And by doing this, you know, 
uh, going around these all different optimization problems, we can actually obtain a theorem that says that you know, if the parameterization is rich enough, which by rich enough, what we mean is that it's a good covering of the underlying space of functions that it is approximating. So for example, in the case of neural networks, that would be continuous functions. In the case of a finite combination of kernels, it's the underlying RKHS, right? If this is a rich enough parameterization, then we can actually show that the solution of that dual, pro dual empirical problem, again, an unconstrained optimization problem, is a Paxi learner. In other words, it will give us a solution that is near optimal and approximately fit, or at least there exists a solution in there that is near optimal and approximately fit. Now, this is the point where I have to go back to the almost to the almost uh, almost everywhere, the point-wise constraints, because it only holds if the loss h is convex. So if the parameterization is nonlinear, this is still a non-convex problem, but the loss has to be convex. In the case of the previous result, the losses can also be non-convex. For example, this could be a sigmoid. As long as they are smooth, they can be non convex So it's worth drilling down into this error just to see exactly what goes in there, because it's actually uh, instructive to take a look at it, right? So there are essentially three components that are interesting to look at. The first one is the influence of the parameterization reaching. The better the parameterization, the closer we get to approximating your optimality. This is something that, you know, in unconstrained learning, you would call perhaps the parameterization error or the approximation error of your, of your uh, of your parameter of your model, right? Uh, the difference here is that we can't really uh, analyze those two errors separately because they are coupled. Uh, they are coupled. We'll see that in a second. Now, obviously, one way to reduce the error here is to increase, you know, the richness of the parameterization, which would also increase its complexity. For example, let's say in this case, for for uh, for instance, the, the VC dimension, right? In which case we would need a larger number of samples in order to be able to better approximate the results, right? So in a sense here, we have like that old, old, old argument of bias variance that we used to have in unconstrained learning. The difference is that this trade-off is now mediated by the requirements difficulty, which is represented here by the optimal dual variables of problems. So because we have this, dual, this strong duality, this duality gap, we can actually show that the optimal dual variables are related to the sensitivity of the problem, how hard a specific constraint is to actually satisfy. That means that, you know, not only now we have this two-way trade-off that we typically found in unconstrained learning, we actually have a three-way trade-off, a trade-off that is not only between the sample size and the parameterization, but also between the sample size, the parameterization, and the type of requirements that we're trying to involve. Right? This is a property now of the specific uh, problem that you're trying to solve, specific instance in the case. Okay, I, I told you that you can't find a solution solving the dual problem, I didn't tell you how. This is the part where I mentioned in the beginning that we're going to address the uh, you know, um, computational problem in, in particular cases, because this is not an easy problem. Even though it is an unconstrained problem, it's not necessarily easy. Now, one algorithm that you can use is by using a primal, a primal dual method, or I would say more specifically, dual ascent method, okay? So the idea is to solve the inner optimization problem, which in this case is ERM problem that we are used to solving every day, you know, in machine learning. You can do that, get an approximate solution of that by using, for example, gradient descent. Okay, so there are a lot of works, you know, about the uh, optimization landscape of of um, the optimization landscape of optimization of, for example, neural networks, which even though are uh, non-convex, can you can that show that you can find a good enough, you know, approximation. Of, of a solution using, for example, gradient descent. Now, if we can get an approximate solution of the inner problem, which is, again, just a penalized um, optimization problem, pen penalized DRM learning problem, we can then tackle the outside problem by essentially using that, um, by updating, let's say, this parameter using the slack, right, the constraint slack. So how close we are to actually satisfying the constraint. Okay? So essentially, if we are satisfying the constraint, we'll reduce the value of lambda. If we are, you know, not satisfying the constraint, we'll increase it. Okay. So this is what this 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 outer optimization problem is. Now, naturally, you can think of this as a, you know, dynamically weighted learning problem. But there is actually a little something a little bit deeper in there that allows us to show that if indeed you are able to obtain this local optimization, good local pro solutions of the original problem, then what you are doing essentially by doing that is 
approximate dual ascent. And you can then prove that you know, in a finite polynomial number of steps in, in, in epsilon, essentially, which is the approximation that you want, you can get the solution that gets within the neighborhood of the optimal solution, which is the solution of the statistical problem, right? So this can show that with high probability, you will converge to, this, to, to a solution that is a good solution to the, uh, of the, to the original problem. Now, naturally, uh, we really can't run uh, stochastic gradient descent ad infinitum here because that's, we don't have enough time, essentially. So what we do in practice is that we will truncate and run you know, the dual step, for example, once per epoch, or run them with different, um, with different uh, step sizes so that you have two, you know, two different time scales for your problems. And this is the results that you have seen before are achieved by essentially that algorithm, which is a minor modification of you know, the, the algorithm you use to train a neural network anyway uh, every day, just by adding this additional um, this additional, you know, step or adaptivity of, of let's say, the lambda. Now, the output of this, the, what is important to look at here is that the output of this optimization problem is not, you know, the value of theta, which is the parameterization that you are interested in, but it is the value of theta and the value of lambda, which is actually the, 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 um, the value of the uh, of, you know, you could think of the regularizer that you need to impose in order to achieve a specific C. Now, this is the difference between what I was mentioning in the beginning, between penalty-based method, fixed penalty-based methods, and dual learning problems, right? In fixed penalty, you have to set the parameter lambda, which is data-dependent, and therefore gives you generalizations in terms of the objective, the, the, the combined objective, right? When, let's say, you use this adaptation mechanism, this specific adaptation mechanism, not any specific adaptation mechanism, but we have proven that for this specific adaptation mechanism, what happens is that you don't need to set lambda, but you let C, which is actually a parameter of the problem and no longer data dependent, and you can get generalization guarantees as the ones that I showed, which are both for the loss and the penalty separately or jointly, if you want to think about that. That's important because that's this gap here, essentially, right? The difference between you choosing a fixed parameter lambda and using these dynamics in order to adapt lambda is what lets you achieve this, uh, you know, this, this improvement in, let's say, the trade-off that you can achieve in, in this type of application. Now, the reason why this is important is because lamb the lambda that, you know, that gets chosen in dual learning is not fixed. And that's actually very important, especially in non-convex problems. The dynamics that we use to solve the problem also influence the solution we get, right? So if we look at the specific case of, for example, robust image recognition that we had before, and we look at the evolution of the adversarial loss with respect to the nominal loss, and at the dual variable, which in this case uh, determines the adversary strength. So there are, how much do we push robustness into the objective, right? So if we look in the beginning, before we meet, you know, we satisfy a certain level of robustness, the dual variables grow using that specific dynamic that we showed before, right? Once we meet this specific level, what happens is that the dual variables start to decrease until at the end, they essentially, it essentially vanishes, right? Now, this type of dynamic is interesting because it has been observed empirically before that it is a good idea to train with an adversary in the beginning of training, but perhaps not in the second half. Once you get a, uh, a model that has good robustness, it's a good idea for you to use a weaker adversary because you know, it will improve your nominal loss, essentially your nominal performance. Right? This is not something that we encoded in the algorithm. Right? This is a property of the specific instance and of the specific problem that we set so that this happens. In a different problem, it might not be needed to have this, this type of dynamic. Right? This is something that you don't need to know a priori. It's something that happens naturally. The other point that is important to make is that it is not that you can just take the dual variable at the end and solve the problem because the dual variable here is essentially zero. That means you are solving a problem which is classical ERM problem, which we know leads to brittle solutions. So it's not exactly the same thing. And this you can see that as well by taking the model that you get at the end and just continue training it using classical ERM. So just training on the clean data. Okay. So what happens by doing that is that compared to random initialization, this warm started model tends to have a better robustness than the one that you start initially at random, right? The reason for that is because 
during this first stage of the dynamic, you were driven to a different location of the, of the optimization landscape, a location that it would seem, I mean, this is now conjecture, it's not the part that we prove, it would seem has like, you know, local minima that are more robust than the local minima you find by just random initialization. Obviously, the model you get doing that is worse than the model that you get using constraint optimization. So the dual variables here, they're not zero. They're close to zero, but they're not zero that uh, you get using. But still, you have this property that, you know, you are in a region that has some, for some reason, has like more robust models than you had by just randomly initializing your resource. Okay. So let me conclude with going back to the claims that I made in the beginning that I set off as my goal to, you know, convince you first that constraint optimization is, okay, a tool, right? The right tool that's just old Brazilian, right? I mean, it's, it's a tool to learn on the required. It's not necessarily the, the best one, but it's certainly one that appears to have much better properties, both theoretically, in terms of giving you more, gen, like more generalization guarantees, but also in terms of applications, as are the ones that I showed you before, but also in terms of performance in those applications, right? Now, then I argued that, you know, constraint learning is a hard problem. Indeed, it's a non-convex statistical optimization problem, which is already hard before. That's a classical learning. But on top of that, we added constraints. But then, you know, we made the problem slightly harder than it was. But it is possible, and it turns out that it is possible. This is a possibility, not really tells you what to do. It's possible to learn under constraint essentially whenever you can learn. Whenever you can do learning today, you could just add certain constraints to it. And it turns out that you can do that by solving penalized DRM problems. Not one penalized DRM problem, but a sequence of them, right? A sequence that is determined by the specific way in which, um, in which you solve uh, that dual step, right? By adjusting the lambda using a specific. Now, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of other things that I you know, did not really have time to mention throughout today. I wanted to skip. First is that, you know, constraint learning is obviously a quite wide framework and it's exploring different applications, so things that we have been doing, including, for example, fairness, invariance, smoothness. Those are all different applications that of this problem that can be used that where constraint learning can be used to solve these problems, right? It's also uh, been, you know, motivating, let's say, some recent work that we did on different forms of robustness. For in this case, probabilistic robustness, which is related to chance constraints in, in, in control problems, that has better properties, let's say, statistical properties than classical, than adversarial robustness. There is a parallel theory in reinforcement learning that can be developed also for doing constraint reinforcement learning. The tools that we use to develop that theory are slightly different. So it's interesting that they're not exactly, you can't use the exact same dual, to obtain strong duality in that case, you need to use a slightly different um, technical uh, tool set, let's say, but the theory is essentially the same in terms of, you know, proving, showing strong duality and then developing algorithms or primal dual algorithms using that. In the case of constraint learning, particularly, it's interesting that you can actually find problems that are quite simple, that classical reinforcement learning with a fixed reward cannot solve, even though constraint reinforcement learning can. That's uh, some recent work that we've done. Uh, one of the things that you know I was talking to Volcan at lunch about was exactly these gradient ascent descent dynamics, like the ones that I mentioned, these primal dual algorithms and primal recovery. This is something that is still not very well under, understood in the general case, just as much as you know, unconstrained learning has all this landscape of optimization knowledge that we understand how well we can get like approximate um, approximate minimization result. Here it's not as clear, so this is still a quite interesting area of research as well as, you know, a lot of constrained inference and let's say control sort of different uh, points of view that we can have on, on these results. Now, the way I look at a lot of, of, of these uh, particularly is as a way to move us, you know, towards a different way of learning, as I mentioned in the beginning, towards an idea not of artificial intelligence, which is typically what we would expect to arise implicitly, you know, from the from, um, from learning, but to an idea of engineered intelligence, where we are able to explicitly tell the problem what we want it to do in the form of constraints in, in, in this case. Uh, obviously, this is not work that I did 
by myself. This is work that these are some of my collaborators that have been involved into this. And you know, if you want to hear more or learn more about some of the work that I did, both these and others, and also find out a little bit more about the group that I, like Dorina mentioned, I just moved to the University of Stuttgart, the group that I'm starting there. You can find more information about that on my website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, for the very interesting and clear presentation. So, um, let's, I think I we have enough a bit of time, time yes. for questions. So, uh, any questions from the audience? So, um, I don't understand why Lambda would be problem dependent, whereas C would be. Would be not problem dependent it would be data dependent that's uh, the thing that i mentioned so what i mean by that is that you know once you uh let me go back to that slide so i don't uh, i don't say things that i don't mean uh what i mean here is that when you choose lambda here in order to achieve a specific set of the penalty you do that by solving this problem for different lambdas consistently right okay this means that lambda depends on the data and i'm, I'm not saying it will jeopardize your generalization, but it might, right? There's no guarantee here that this generalization is not jeopardized by the lambda. In this case, I understand that in the end, you're doing the exact same thing and you're tricking it into doing it differently. It's just that in this case, you can guarantee that the lambda that gets chosen doesn't actually affect the generalization that you get. What I'm asking is that the reason why I optimize lambda in the first part is that I have some downstream task I want to be good at. Right. So I could also tune C. You can tune C, yeah, yes, exactly. But C. I, I see your point. I, I think the, the the point here, in my opinion, is, and this is now it's in the realm of opinions. We can disagree about this. C, in in a sense, is more interpretable than lambda, in the sense that C is a bound on a on how good you want to be on a penalty. Okay, lambda is how much do you want to include that penalty in your training? How much does that actually affect? Depends on how are you going to train, the type of algorithms, the step sizes that you use. This is something that I could tell you, look, I want the, the accuracy to be 90%. I put here a 0, 1 loss, I bound 90%, and that's what you get. Okay, that's not a problem I can solve. But if I put the 0, 1 loss here, you can put 90% in lambda. I could say I value my penalty 10 times more. And does that get you 90%? Well, why I mean, okay. Yes. I mean, we can disagree about whether valuing my penalty 10 times more is more is perhaps more or less interesting than saying I want accuracy 90%. You know, I mean, in, 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 as an engineer, I, I, I want the accuracy to be 90%, not the accuracy to be penalized 10 times more than, it's just a harder way to think about things. But obviously, once you know how to solve these problems, you understand what the trade-off is, you know that it has to be 10 times more. For somebody that is perhaps not as familiar with the training, this is perhaps more the way that we would set requirements in an engineering setting. But I, I completely agree with you that this is an interpretation problem. And what people find more or less you know, attractive as a way to think is, is different. Yeah. There's a second minor point. At some point, you said that there's strong value that holds when you have expectations. Is it that the expectation is convex, but the finite sum isn't? Is that the no, no. Point? They are both non convex problems. They're both, they're they are both non convex problems, yes. Okay. The loss itself can be non convex. And, and just like. So the, expect, the expected. The expect, yes, the expected value of the loss is still non convex. Yes. The, the, there is no. There is no there is, it's not really based on hidden convexity. It's, hidden, it's really hinging on the fact that you are solving a variational problem rather than a finite dimensional one. It is nothing. It doesn't have to be, do with the fact that the expectation somehow makes a non convex problem convex. It's. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good point. Yeah. Just to follow up on that point. So uh, the constraints, do you have any assumptions on the constraints? Are they also non-convex? Yeah, they, there are a lot of assumptions, yes. Uh, yeah. They are. With respect to smoothness and mm -hmm. So I mentioned then in the beginning when I said, so just let me just find this slide here. So these are the these are essentially the assumptions that we have in the paper. Okay, this is all. So first, they have to be smooth. Lipschitz continues even. Okay, this is somewhat typical. They have to be bounded. That has to do with the learning theoretic bounds, right? They typically require boundaries. Other than that, they can be non-convex. The only one that has to be convex is the one that is almost sure. Okay, in the case if you don't solve almost sure, then they can be non-convex as well. And then the parameterization itself that can be non-linear or linear. It doesn't matter. 
but they all have to be smooth. And you also have like, you know, this is how you essentially avoid the specific cases where you could, uh, you know, embed a, you know, NP hard problem into this, which is somewhat easy to do, but then you need to either violate some sort of, you know, um, strict feasibility of the inner set, or you need to use a non-smooth function, or you need to have an exponential number of constraints, which also breaks uh, the results in the end. Because if, if the results at the end depends on the log number of constraints, you have an exponential, then it will, you can blow it up. Other questions? Question. Uh, from what I, I understand is that uh, you are essentially summing a main max in the region. So what's the difference between the solution you found and uh, the minimax point? So this is this goes back to the point that um, that that I mentioned in the end about primal recovery. Okay. So the mean, the pro, the solution, the properties of the solutions that I mentioned are properties of the minimax point. Okay, they are properties of that point specifically, or one of those points at least, because you could have multiple of those points of those saddles in the problem, which is why you get these oscillatory behaviors in primal dual or minimax problems, even in the linear case, right? Even in the affine case. So. That is a problem. Now, if obviously, if your primal is strongly convex, for example, that is not a point that matters because you only have one solution to the Lagrange that stuff. So that that solution that we are seeking for is actually the minimax solution. Okay, it's it's the saddle point that actually solves the dual problem. I feel like I didn't answer your question. Yes. yes. No. Somewhat. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, just uh, feel free to follow up. It's a. Uh, Other questions, please. Can, can you say that again? Sorry. And you had learning Yes. When we had you describe the model complexity, yes, the constraints. The that's that's actually a very interesting thing not in the result that we get which is the thing that is um, that i find interesting about this so you would think that if you add a constraint the model complexity will reduce the problem is that the constraint set that we have is a stochastic constraint set because it depends on the samples and the fact that it depends on the samples it, you don't get that effective reduction in the sample complexity that you wish you could have by you know limiting the number of problems it's because learning the constraint set is also also has some difficulty assigned to it, and that's where you you lose, let's say, the gains that you would have if you could impose that strictly. Uh, it would be possible to obtain um, something like the dependence on the uh, common member, or let's say, or this is a suit. It's that. So I think I think that I I think you're right. The fact that we, you know, the bounds we have here are, are pack bounds. So they are distribution independent. That, that really puts a hard restriction on what you can do in particular. I believe that, I do believe that that's a artifact of the sort of the learning theory that we are using in order to do this. So if you could, if you would allow for either data dependent bounds or, or for example, pack based, right based, or even Perhaps if you could exploit some sort of locality from the fact that, you know, perhaps that um, the point that you find is somehow weak convex, right? You have a strong convexity around the minima. This type of, uh, of result, there's a result from um, Roberto Oliveira, I think, is from uh, IMPA in Brazil. He has some sort of bounds that are not related, that don't use, you know, VC dimension or, or, or uniform convergence at all. They use some sort of Talagrand inequality for that depend on sort of the size of the set on, under which you are optimizing. And in that case, perhaps there is something that can be done. But in the general case, it's really a little bit like it's a loss. But that's a very interesting uh, line of research, I would say, which is like, okay, this is a sort of a first step, right? The next step would be really, what else can we do that actually recover the gains that we wish we could get out of these statistical constraints? Yeah, very good one. Any other questions? 
from your results, can I say that uh, uh, with your optimization method, uh, the robustness is improved? Well, I mean, in, in, in that specific benchmark that people use, it was, right? I mean, I, I don't want to be making bold claims without having, you know, the specific, in the, in the paper, the benchmarks that we use, which are the benchmarks that trades use as well. Yes, you have a better optimization, you have a better, um, result in terms of robustness. But I think that you have a better trade-off in terms of robustness than trades gives you. I would put it like that. Right. Uh, so, so I, I can understand what you about this. So uh, for this data set, the robustness is improved uh, from the perspective of the optimization measure. Yes, I think, look, uh, yes. I would say that the reason why we get better results are by using two ingredients in that case. One is this primal dual algorithm, and the other one is sampling. Those are the two ingredients that uh, make things better. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting perspective. Yeah. Usually, because usually, I think, um, robustness, uh, it's difficult to improve robustness uh, from the perspective of the optimization technique. Right. I think that the big change there uh, that I think might, might be interesting is the fact that, uh, you know, instead of optimizing for the for the, the the disturbance that we learn against, we actually sample that disturbance, which means that, you know, you 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 also get more, uh, you get some disturbance that are not the worst case, right? Because you are sampling, but you also sometimes hit a little bit further because you have this additional Brownian motion that is moving you around a little bit, uh, that has like perhaps a little bit more of exploration. That is something that you know is related to some results that you could have in terms of you know stochastic gradient descent com uh, connected to Langevin Monte Carlo, for example, which is the technique we use. It's yeah, I mean there's no there is no proof yet. Those dynamics are dynamics that we are still looking into the convergence of. It's not uh, in the paper specifically. We don't have results. So uh, the sampling technique here. Yes. That's actually, uh, yeah, interesting. Any other question? Online, maybe there are people still active. I can see it. I cannot monitor it, sir. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions in the chat. Yeah. You know. So then, uh, please join me in thanking Louise again for being here to present. Yeah. Thank you. Some announcements. <laughs> yes, please. I can. So just some words for closing. Thank you very much for talk today. Uh, we can meet again here on campus the twenty seventh for the Get to Know Your Neighbor seminar with Matt Stensrud, or the sixth of March for the Get to Know Your Neighbor with Professor Bartley Planke. Or again on March 9 to 10 for the Riken ARP workshop, which is going to be hybrid with a Japanese delegation on campus uh, here at the Griffith. So thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>